So this is the session that changes everything. Because if you get the hang of this, you will absolutely positively be the number one best marketer in your field, bar none. This changes everything. Remember I said it's about working smarter, not working harder. The problem with this is it requires you to work really smarter. <laughs> okay, so it's a little harder in the beginning because it just takes a quantum leap over typical me marketing, which is what most people do. They focus on themselves, they focus on their needs, what they want, their desires, or their internal greatest strengths, their, you know, what positions them above their competition. And of course, some of that is important, but I'm going to show you how to be a better marketer than anyone just in this next uh, 45 minutes to an hour. So this says, master your market, the super strategist will win every time. And again, I talked a little bit about this earlier because most people have no idea what that means, what a strategist is versus a tactician. So I'm going to spell it out for you. But let's start off with the problems that all of you are having, generic problems that probably, as I go through these, will point out, you know, half of those problems come from this challenge right now. The clutter factor is the single greatest marketing challenge anybody has. In 1992, the average consumer received 3,000 commercial messages per day. Anybody guess what it's up to now? 30,000 commercial messages. You know you were on one of my sessions where I said <laughs> So important decision makers receive even more. So if you go after consumers, that's, you know, you're still dealing with enormous clutter. I worked with, uh, as it was pointed out, I worked with the movie studios. And in my dealings with Sony, they were pointing out that the average movie would take, in 1995, something like 5 million, and you could get like 30% market recognition. And now, I just saw it, they're saying it's 30 million <laughs> for the same market recognition. Why? You know, we used to have three television stations, now we have, I have 300 or so. I don't even know, it's some unbelievable number, 500 maybe. So the world has just become a much busier place and this has created an enormous challenge for all of you because the first part of it is just trying to stand out in that clutter, it's just enormous. And I want to try and teach you this single most effective way for you to stand out in that clutter. And then we've got some great technology coming. So what this has done is it's tripled the cost of trying to get in front. And in fact, that date is now three or four years old. So it's probably more because I mentioned to you, Sony said five million, now it's 30 million for the same exact, well, that's more than triple. That's six time increase. And it would be great if in fact you're spending three times more than you were a decade ago in order to get three times more the effectiveness, but what do you think has happened? Spending three times more or six times more and getting half the result that you used to get. It used to take four attempts to get in front of a buyer, now it takes 8.4 attempts. So the bottom line is you're spending three times more to get half the result you used to get. So let's talk about strategy versus tactics. I've presented that information and literally had executives say to me, okay, well then we'll just have to have our guys try twice as hard or three times harder. And that's the tactical approach. And so some of you may be saying, well, okay, that's what I got to do, then I'll just be more, you know, try harder. The strategic approach is trying smarter. And so if I challenged you right now, and again, remember we talked about this, working on the business, if I challenge you right now, what could you do that on the very first try would be so intriguing that your prospects would go, what? What's that? You just totally capture their imagination or their attention, and they would want to know more. What can you offer? What approach could you take that would make your prospect want to know more right on the spot? Just stop them right cold in their tracks. Okay, I'll give you a hint. It's probably not going to be you saying something about your product or service. It's going to be something that's way more important to them than that. And it has to be something that's important to them, not something that's important to you. And that sounds real obvious, but I'm going to drive that home with a sledgehammer. Okay, so this is all about working smarter. Now, in my experience of working with 50 of the largest companies in the world and with working with hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs, I've basically defined there's three types of executives that I've worked with. Okay, the first is a strategic executive. That's very rare. Maybe 2% in my entire experience and all the companies I've worked with are what I call strategic executive. That's the big thinkers. They think first, but the problem with a purely strategic executive 
who's got a great brain for coming up with big solutions and what they call shifting the paradigm. You've heard that saying, or uh, well, I call it shifting the buying criteria, changing how people think about how they buy, is that executive generally does not implement very well. The big thinkers are bad at implementing. That's what I found. Um, that's, uh, like I said, and that's only 2%. Most of them can't even think about, you know, some clever new way to, to try and penetrate a market. The tactical executive, this is like 98% of all the executives, and again, they just see, you know, if it takes eight tries to get in front of the buyer, well, we'll just try eight tries. But again, the best executive is the combination of the two. The ultimate executive develops strategic solutions and implements them with piercing effectiveness at the tactical level. So they will then, when they come up with the big ideas, when it comes time to getting them working down in, you know, at the tactical level, they'll have the procedures, the policies, the plans. They'll put everything into place to make that thing work. That executive, I can tell you, I've met two in my entire career, and we're really saying something here. So what I want to try and do is force you to be this executive by putting you through some fantastic exercises in the next hour to first get you highly strategic in your thinking. We're going to force you to think way more strategically about how you approach your business and it's going to change everything. And then over the next two days, we're going to drill down on all those tactics that you need to do to make all this stuff work. So what we've kind of gone through today is this is foundational stuff. This is like the basics, you know. You got to be good at time management. You got to understand how to do workshops. You got to understand how to work with your staff. Those you got those are the basics. Okay? Now we're going to go into the strategies in terms of your model, your business model, you know, how you're going to approach your market and then, you know, the next 2 days are all tactics. You know, it's uh, Friday and Saturday it's tactical, 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 tactical. You know, now we're down in the in the <coughs> implementation stage. Okay, so let's try and make you the ultimate executive. That's the goal. Right now, we're going to help you build your strategies and maximize your taxes. We're going to force you to think through this entire process to maximize your market position, your results from your marketing effort. Most of you are not being strategic in that regard, and you don't force yourself to maximize, and I'll prove it to you. And then, of course, your business model. I talked about this earlier, but I've got some exercises that will make it really dynamic in terms of you thinking about your business model in terms of its opportunity to open up greater uh, situations for you. So marketing definitions, first of all, tactical definition is a tactic is an ad, a trade show, a brochure, a meeting with a client, your website. These are all tactics. Strategy says what's the long range goal, what's the overall impact I want each one of those things to have. And I will bet you, unless you're a client of mine, you've never thought about that. You know, what, what do I want to be ultimately? Because if I got you to think of where you want to be ultimately in the mind of the buyer, does that change what you're doing now at the tactical level? Think about that. Mm -hmm. If I got you to think through what 10 strategic objectives do you want to try and achieve in front of every single buyer, how does that change what you're doing now when you're in front of that buyer? Because most of you aren't thinking that way. If I got you to think about what's the ultimate perception you want your client to have about you, and most of you have not thought about that, it changes how you're going to be, behave at the tactical level. So what's the ultimate accomplishment, ultimate position you want in the market, and how do your tactical efforts support and help you accomplish that position? It sounds real simple, but nobody does it. And seriously, amazing. When your salesperson gets in front of a client, how many different things do you want to have happen? So I, let me ask you that right now. Think about that. Or again, you one person armies. You get in front of a client. What do you want to have occur? Most of you would say, well, you know, I'd like to get the client. I go, okay, that's a good objective. What else? And you go, well, what else is there? I go, well, mm, do you want brand loyalty? Well, yeah, that's important. Excuse me, would you like to preempt your competitors? Meaning, can you, is there a way? You can do something that would make it so when your competitors call, they won't even listen. Oh, never thought about that. Uh, do you want referrals? Oh, yeah, referrals would be good. So I'm going to take you through like 13, 14, 15 different strategic objectives you could achieve in just a sales call or at a trade show. How many different strategic objectives are you achieving at your trade shows? Who goes to trade shows? Sells at trade shows. Okay, better than half the room. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Because most of you are not accomplishing one-tenth of what you could at those trade shows. Or your magazine ads. You know, what do you want to do with your magazine ads? You say, oh, I want to drive response. 
Well, is that all? So there's a lot of things you can do with those tactics. And if I get you to think through those things, not today because, again, today I'm just trying to lay the foundation. But tomorrow we have an exercise where we're going to have all your tactics and you're going to go through and list out all the strategic objectives you want to achieve. And what you're going to find is the same exact things you're doing now, the same money you're spending now, the same time and energy you're spending now, you can achieve two, three, four, five, ten times more impact using the stuff that I want to show you here. So here's a real simple but an excellent example of achieving strategic objectives on purpose. Because most people, if they do it, it's by accident. So you have two furniture stores. In furniture store one, salespeople sell furniture, sales are made. And over a four-year period, these people increased at about 10% per year, mostly because of the price of furniture went up. In store two, so this store, you walk in, you say, yeah, and I'm cutting to the chase here, but yeah, I'd like to buy a couch. Right this way to couches, sir. Salesman tries to sell you a couch. In store two, salespeople sell furniture, but they're also constantly trained to sell the store. So on your way to the couches, you say, is this your first time in the store? Yes, no, doesn't matter. You start selling the store. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the store. Or if you know the store, then you know that we're a family-owned business and, you know, whatever your strategic objective is. So if you want to build brand loyalty, so what happens is this store over the same period of time actually opened up six locations. And the brand loyalty was amazing. This is my first sales job as a salesperson. And they taught us. And, I mean, I just, I, you know, I would go on to work at hundreds of other companies, well not hundreds, but work with hundreds of companies, and never find another company that was as good at selling the store as these guys were. So there was no strategic objective to sell the company. And so therefore, there was no brand loyalty built on purpose. And I only worked there a year, but in that year I have to tell you that the same people came back again and again and again. So is that one of your strategic objectives and are you accomplishing that? Are you specifically selling the store when they come in there? Okay. And then it says, this is done on purpose. So strategy is driving sales. In most cases, sales doesn't have any strategy. You know, it's just to make a sale. But there's a lot of other things you want to do. Okay. So here's a great way to get you to think about it. It's what I call the stadium pitch. And uh, even if you've gone through this exercise, I'm going to go much deeper this time. And let's imagine that I could present, I could put you in front of a room to present for your entire audience right now. They could put them in your entire potential buyers all in one room and give you a chance to walk out there and present to them all at once. So let me ask a question. Who here is ready for that right now? Okay, three people. You think you're ready? Well, we did it in the five and one. Uh-huh, but you're not ready then, for sure. <laughs> Okay, so what do you want to accomplish in that? But let me define the audience for you, all right? Because this is a very powerful exercise. It does a lot of different things, and I'll point it out as we go, okay? What would be your strategic... Now, this is the audience for any product or service. Breaks down into a pyramid. If you want to write something down, this would be a great little thing for you to write down because it gets you to think about what your potential market is. So this is who's in your stadium. You always have a percentage who are buying right now. That's that top 3% right here. Okay, they are what's called buying now. Then you have another 6% who are open to it. We're still in the top, very, very top part of the pyramid. This is for any product or service. Like if we're looking at cars, this weekend, 3% of the market will go out and buy a new car. Let's just have a little test. Anyone in here going to buy a car in the next week? One, two, 2%. We're slightly off. 2% of them, because they've got 100 people, two of you uh, are going to go out and buy a car, okay? So how many people, though, in the next 90 days know they're going to need a car, their lease is coming up, and they might buy a car? Show of hands. So exactly like six, another 6%. So that's pretty much any product or service. So what that tells you, first of all, is at any given time, you've got about 3% of your market is buying right now, whether you are in front of them or not. Whether you are marketing and reaching them, they are buying right now. And then you've got this other percentage who know they're going to be buying. Those are the people that generally your marketing targets. And that's the people who notice it. Because when do you notice an ad for tires? When you're buying tires, right? Otherwise, you don't notice an ad for tires. It's not going to work. Let's say that this divides into three equal parts. The last 91% divides into three equal parts. The top is not thinking about it. Again, about a third of your audience at any given time, not thinking about it. It's not something they need. It's not something they want. They're not buying it now. Just, it's just not, it hasn't occurred to them. Then you have the not interested, or I would put another word in there, think they're not interested. 
Because aren't there people, in some of your cases, who might think they're not interested, but yet if you could get in front of them, you could persuade them to be interested? Does anybody know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. For what you sell, you might at any given time, if you were hot you know, and persuasive and got in front of that client who thought they weren't interested, there's a good chance you could turn them into interested. And again, our goal is to drive people up this pyramid. And then you have the definitely not interested, not buying ever, think they're not interested, the not interested, and then the definitely not buying. So this crowd down here, you know, if you t sell telephone systems, for example, you know, they just bought one. They're not going to buy a telephone system. <laughs> or whatever you sell, it might just very well be that their brother sells it. So if you do convince them to buy it, they'll say thanks very much and go buy it from their brother. I have a client that sells um, health insurance to corporations. Well, you know, they would often run into brokers who the... The CEO's brother sells health insurance. You're not going to get that account. You can do a great job. You're not going to get it. So there's people you're not going to get, but the goal is great marketing drives them up the pyramid. But remember that 91% don't think they're interested right now. So if 91% of your market is not interested right now, what could you say that would make them interested? That's the strategic challenge. What could you say that would make somebody who doesn't think they need your product or service now go, hmm? What's that? Because if it's interesting to the people who don't think they need it, how interesting is it going to be to the people who do? Super interesting. Again, I'm just forcing you to be a little more strategic here, and I'm going to really spell this out. Remember I said this is working smarter, and this is the hardest part of working smarter. Is could you get the hang of this? It's going to change everything. Okay, so a great stadium pitch drives people up the pyramid. So let me, you got, we got two people in here said they were ready to go in front of their stadium, right? So let's uh, make it more challenging. Right before you walk out, you people who think you're ready, I turn to the audience and let's say that you're their stadium. And I say to you, okay, folks, you had to come, but you don't have to stay. They had to come, but they can get up and walk out. So you better come out talking about things that are of interest to them. That's where great marketing leaves amateur marketing in the dust, okay? So what do you want to accomplish? What would be your strategic? So think about this. Because if, in fact, you could formally prepare all the things you'd want to accomplish in front of that entire stadium, and then we then forced you to translate that, that's really what you should be doing even one-on-one -on -one with every single customer. All the things you do in this big stadium is what you should be doing with every customer. So I want to force you to think through every single customer as having that same kind of awesome opportunity. You want them to be able to send you referrals. You want them to be able to communicate more effectively. If they go out of the room and they talk to somebody else about what it is that you sell, don't you want them to be able to communicate that? And you want them to have the information that would motivate that person to want to buy. So there's a lot of strategic things you want to achieve. All right? Stadium exercises to get you to think strategically before you operate tactically. All right? And who should be... Who should you be targeting? So let's figure that out right now. Who is in your stadium? Because that might change depending upon the exercise I'm going to put you through. So one of, the, one of my partners, we've done a lot of stuff together, is Jay Abraham. And he teaches a concept, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. We'll do some exercises with it called, uh, well, it calls it many different things. But basically, he tries to teach you that if you have a good reputation and you have good clients who trust you and respect you, that's an asset. And what Jay teaches is that that asset can make you money in many other ways if you're smart enough to take advantage of it. And so thinking about your company as strategically as possible can make a huge difference in how you can attract buyers and then also how much more you can make from every single buying situation. Again, I'm just trying to teach you to be strategic, so let me drive it home. All right? So it says, de define your business. What business are you in? Develop the broadest possible view of your business, focusing on the ultimate benefit to your client. So this is a great little exercise I'm going to put you through in a minute. So it's 1907, and I own Pennsylvania Railroad, one of the most powerful organizations in the world at that time. I'm wealthy beyond belief. I'm one of the four richest men in the world. And I've got the money to do anything I want. And this little guy by the name of Henry Ford just put his first 700 trucks off an assembly line. I remember the Industrial Revolution, eighth grade, you know, uh, history class. And Henry Ford just came out with 700 trucks, which cost at that time, you know, $200 a piece. I could buy all 700 if I want to because I'm Pennsylvania Railroad and, you know, we're a rich, successful company. Now, 
they thought they were in the railroad business. But what started to happen in those days, by the way, 85% of all freight in the country was shipped by railroad. Do you know what percentage is today? It's like 3%. <laughs> you know what percentage is shipped by truck? 85%. So if they thought of themselves as providing transportation, what that would have led to is when Henry Ford come off the assembly line with those cars, they would have bought those cars. And then ultimately, when United started coming up with airlines, they would have bought the airlines. And Pennsylvania Railroad would be one of the most powerful organizations on the planet. By the way, that is a real company, not just from Monopoly, but you know where they are today? They are bankrupt. Thank you. Let's say you think you sell suits. And again, this is the most basic definition of what you think you do. Okay, so you know, I'll, I'll, I'll share it with all you guys right here, right now. I teach how to get high-level executives on the phone. It's one of my uh, skill areas. And so I had this idea for uh, the men's warehouse. So I try to get a meeting with uh, George Zimmer of the men's warehouse. And I use all the stuff that I'm teaching you here. It was nine or ten things in a row, 10 days in a row. So he finally calls me up to tell me to stop calling him. <laughs> you know, he says, listen, uh, you know, you're clever and your stuff is fun or funny or whatever. He said, but you know, I'm just calling you to tell you I'm not interested. And I had an idea that I felt would double his sales. So I say to him, I go, listen, um, you know, I have a concept that'll double your sales. Remember earlier I was talking about how, you know, if someone turns you down, you need six time, at least six ways to come back and keep trying. Well, it's funny because when he returned my phone call, one of my vice presidents was there and he picked up the other line and each time I tried to close the guy, he would hold up a finger. And so I know, I can't remember now, but it was like 11 times I asked this guy for a meeting and 11 times he said no. So toward the end of the conversation, we're going back and forth and back and forth and I go, look, you know, uh, I have this concept that's going to help you double your sales. He says, there is no concept that would help me double my sales. If there was, I would have thought of it. And you know, to his credit, hey, you know, Seriously, to his credit, you know, very successful company, very successful retail organization. So I go, um, I go, all right, well, I'll tell you what. I said, what do you think of an idea that would help you increase your sales by 20%? Would that be worth an hour of your time? I was trying to get an hour of his time. He goes, ah, you're losing credibility. He said, first you said you're going to double my sales, and now you're saying well, I'm going to increase my sales by 20%. I said, I said, ah, I'm not losing credibility. I said, I'm just trying to get the number down to where you can believe it. I know I can double your sales, but if I can make it where you can believe it, you'll give me a meeting. And so I don't remember what the close was specifically, but one of those closes, I said, you know, what about that? Is 20% uh, increased worth an hour of your time? Now, what do you do when you close? Yeah. Shut up. You've got sales guys in the room. They know that. When you close, you shut up. You keep talking, you can close. So I said, what about that? Can that get me a meeting? I'm serious. It was like a minute of silence. <laughs> Not a word. He's sitting there smiling because the guy is at a retail organization. They've trained him when they close, they shut up. And then I hear his pen tapping on the desk. He goes, okay, got yourself a meeting like this. So here's the concept. I'll teach it to all of you right now because they didn't execute very well. But I will take credit for something. So the idea was basically let's take... You know, right now their cards say wardrobe consultants. That's something that I contribute. Although, you know, if you try to prove it, I don't know that you could necessarily. But now all the cards say wardrobe consultant. And I know they didn't say it before I did my thing over there. But anyway, you know, when you walk in to buy a suit from the average sales suit salesperson, you know, they, the only impression you get is that they want to sell you a suit. So my concept was let's have these wardrobe consultants would actually do a little profile of what you have in your wardrobe. And by the way, this is based not on my idea, but the number one suit salesperson in the country is a guy who works for Nordstrom's. And he does, I forget what it is, whether he personally makes a million or he sells a million dollars, some unbelievable number of suits. You're shaking your head, you know what, what I'm talking about. What this guy does is he measures every inch of your body. He has all your measurements. He has a full profile of every single thing you have in your wardrobe. And so when he gets in new suits that he, and again, he's appealing to guys like me who can buy whatever suits that they want. And when he gets a new suit in that he thinks you would like and he knows what you have in your closet, he has it tailored for you, two of them at a time, shirts, ties to match, and sends it to the, sends it to the guy. And something like nine out of ten of them keep nine out of ten of the stuff that he sends because he understands them. He knows what they want. He knows what they like. 
So and this guy does some unbelievable figure, like a million dollars a year in, in, in suits. So I read that article and said, you know, they should institutionalize that. A lot of companies do things successfully, but not systematically. <laughs> There's a huge difference there, okay? So anyway, that was my idea. I figured let's, you know, and then let's systematize that because you guys know from the last session how big I am in systemization. Let's systematize this. And the ultimate, the broadest possible view would be an image consultant understanding a little bit more because now I can really market like crazy to you. I can teach you like, for example, I'm uh, being videotaped today and you notice I'm wearing a blue shirt. That's not by accident. My image consultant in the back of the room said you don't want a white shirt because it, against all the light that's going on up here, it kind of makes you look pale on the video. So you want to use a blue shirt or a, a different color, not a white shirt. So an image consultant would know all that. He would know like, uh, for example, uh, dress for success. Just take that book and storyboard the thing, teach these guys to be. So I just thought if they were that good and, and, and they systematized it, they could have a massive impact on the organization. Here's another one, lumber and hardware store. So again, true story. I uh, haven't had many bouts of trying to be Joe Handyman, but in one small moment, I decided when my kids were young, we have a big wraparound porch on the back of the house, and it goes down to a swimming pool. And I decided I would put a gate there. My wife wanted to let the kids play on this big porch, but she didn't want them to be able to go down in the swimming pool, so I decided to put a gate there. So I walk into the local lumber store right up the street here, and I start trying to figure out how to do this gate. And I have to buy everything because I don't have anything. My father was very handy, but I just got swept away, never really got around to uh, learning it. But I kind of like that, you know, it's that tool thing, men like tools. I own every tool, it's boxes of them I never even open. But um, I had, you know, <laughs> it's er, tools. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build this gate. And I go up to the counter and I go, listen, I'm trying to build a gate for the back and it needs to be like four feet wide because it's a big wide stair. When the guy goes, let me stop you right there. We're not allowed to give advice. Now, I'm dead serious, okay? Let me take you to a home improvement center and let me take you to Home Depot that not only will they give you advice, you can go to classes and learn how to add on addition to your house. You can learn how to put on a roof. You can learn they've got books. They've got training. So what they've done is they have created home improvement experts. And what do you think that's done to their brand loyalty? Do you know how many people go and buy only from Home Depot because they've created this brand these experts. Uh, Jay, I know you just asked to speak for Office Depot. So here's Office Depot. They just sell office supplies. And now what they're doing is they're doing webcasts with three, 4,000 business owners teaching these business owners how to succeed in their business. So Web's, uh, Jay's going to be one of their speakers. Okay. Now that's not really their thing is teaching you how to succeed, but what does that do for you if I'm with Office Depot and I'm going to teach you guys how to be more successful in your business. So I'm just trying to show you. So who are you targeting? That's first thing. Okay. Now let's have you write the title of your stadium speech. Let's have you write the title because if it's a feature driven title, you're dead meat. It, if we already know 91% of the market is not buying what it is you're selling, what's the title? The title of your stadium pitch should be focused on them. It should be something that rivets their attention and it, uh, take a minute and write that down right now. So, and then I'll just try and work with you on those titles because it'll make a huge difference in how much attention you can attract and sometimes writing those titles opens up a whole new world of marketing that you would have never appealed to before. First strategic objective, again I'm going to steal somebody else's idea here, but something I really uh, feel that I explain very well is Jay Abraham has a concept that you don't have customers, you have clients. So the definition of a customer is someone who buys from somebody else, it should say customer. The definition of a client is one who is under the care, protection, and guidance of an expert in a particular field. So if your clients are under your care, guidance, and protection, and you have to be an expert, it changes what you do with them at the tactical level. Let's talk about this as it relates to your approach to marketing. Now, this is a great example because it's a mundane example. It's a shoe store. And what kind of strategic objective does this create for you if you have clients? Because the shoe store, they think they have customers, but I'm saying if you have clients, what else do you need to know in order to serve those clients? Okay. 
And Kara Guns, okay, so shoe store becomes an expert, not just on the shoes, which most are not anyway. In fact, when I first got involved with the shoe store, they told me that there was no difference in shoes. Basically, the not, you know, I mean, construction of shoes is shoes. Well, that's what the CEO told me. Ah, there's very little difference. Turned out there were 28 different decisions that the shoemakers make and all related to quality of that shoe. So, and this is the CEO of a, of a company that sells, you know, millions of shoes every year. And the duck farm becomes an expert not just on the ducks, but on the restaurants that they serve and the things that will help their clients succeed. So most companies are focused on themselves, and if you focus on your clients, suddenly it creates all kinds of wonderful things, as I'll talk about. Okay. So market information. Here's the first critical lesson of a great marketer. Market information is way more motivational than product information. Let that one sink in for a second. Market information is way more motivational than product information. Okay, so again, I'm going to use shoes as an example because it's very mundane and one would think, well, you know, what, you know, what kind of an expert do I need to be? Let me challenge you. If you're trying to sell shoes, can you think of market data that would help you sell more, sell better, and plus a few other criti critical objectives? Right now, if I said to you, your challenge is to sell shoes, what kind of market data would help you sell more shoes? Very good. You said, how many shoes the average person buys in a year? Because that can be used as motivation. So uh, here is their stadium speech, which we built for them. This is the areas covered from their stadium spe speech. Now this, in their case, is used as a training tool. A woman's love affair with shoes. So their stadium pitch, which initially they used as a training vehicle for all their people now, used to be they had opinions about shoes they were not trained on any of this stuff. Now, every one of them can tell you the history of shoes. They literally can tell you when the first shoe was invented in this country. Do you know when the first sneaker was invented? Do you know who wore the first shoe? Do you know all those things? It seems un unimportant, but what happens is if you're an expert and your, care your client's under your care, guidance, and protection, it means you need to be an expert. And watch how this sells more shoes. First impressions and the threshold effect. We actually found a study that shows how you make an impression based upon the quality of your shoes. That when, in fact, they had one study where people would look at someone and then if they were wearing really expensive shoes, they would notice the shoes and give them a second look. Like if you watch the eye, they, had, you know, they would monitor with the eye. It's called the threshold effect. It's the first impact you have when you walk into a room. People make something like, David, you could probably tell about this because he works with plastic surgeons and we use the same research for that. Plastic surgeons, when they're doing their stadium speech, which is one of the things this company uh, provides, is they will teach people about how people make 32 assumptions about them based upon their appearance alone. That they haven't spoken a word yet. And one of those is if they have expensive shoes, the uh, perception goes up. So. Let's teach people about the psychological impact of shoes. Expensive shoes cause a more profound and positive impact. Wealthier women own more shoes, or maybe you, if you own more shoes, you'll be wealthier. <laughs> okay? Feet and fashion is another area. Do you know that you have 214,000 nerve endings in your feet that connect to every organ in the body? Do you know that Regis Philbin passed a kidney stone by getting a foot massage? That, in fact, that's so connected to your organs, they can, now this is Regis Feldman. I mean, you know, this is real stuff. There's a book out on it. Uh, we found that for them. They had no idea. They had no idea. And then 15 essentials of a killer shoe. Here's a thing they give out now. It's called the shoeaholic scale. Seven, that's the men's average. Fifteen, uh, get going. You've got some shopping to do. And so you go down here. We get down to Mel DeMarcus, and she's got 1,200 pairs of shoes. Celine Dion has 400. Sarah Jessica Parker, 200 pairs of shoes. And so, and they use this very effectively. I'm telling you, you laugh, but it's really, really powerful. So here's our hope to make you master of strategy. This is all about working smarter, not harder, because there's a ton of strategic objectives to get achieved when you get to be the expert in your market. So let's show you how data can help you make the impossible sales. So I'm going to give you, and again, if you're on a 5-on-1 call where you heard this already, I just came up with this literally in the last two weeks, even though I used it in three or four of those 5-on-1 calls. But it's a quick illustrative exercise. If you help your clients succeed, in what areas do you need to be an expert? So right now, if you want to help your clients be more successful, what do you need to be an expert on? And I'm going to show you how this changes everything about the sales model. What do you need to be an expert on if you're going to help your clients succeed?
not just what you do, like I'll just use you as an example, and you're a graphics designer. What does that do for people? It helps them build brand awareness. It helps lift their impression of you. So you need to understand, you know, the psychological impact of color, for example. Design, colors, what shapes attract the eye more than anything else. And if you offered me, and I'm vice president of marketing for some company, you offered me a free orientation on those things, you'll get meetings every single day if you're going to teach me how to be more successful in my marketing than if you want to come and talk to me about your design services. Okay, so let me give you an example, because I've got a really good worksheet for you on this, so we'll really put you through it. So, the impossible sale motivating medical doctors. So I'm going to talk about, let's say that you have homeopathic remedies. First of all, do we have any medical doctors in the room? I did this at an event, and I said medical doctors only do two things. They write prescriptions, and they perform surgeries. In some cases, those are very critical things, and they make a difference between staying alive and dying. But I, the example I use is my own doctor. Every time I go to him, no matter what's wrong with me, within five minutes, he's offered three different prescriptions. You know, like... Oh, we'll give you antibiotics for that. And I go, well, do I really need to, like, you know, and flood my whole system with antibiotics to take care of this one little thing on my right earlobe over here? Okay, well then, no, let's not go with that kind of antibiotic. What about this kind of antibiotic? I'm literally telling you actual true stories. So medical doctors, they don't necessarily, you know, a lot of them don't even believe in that diet and how that affects you. And they're coming around now, but, you know, medical doctors are against homeopathic remedies, I had a very serious health, health problem with my, I had to have a third of my colon removed, and they said it had nothing to do with my diet. You know, how can you say that? So anyway, the setup. Let's say you want to motivate medical doctors to sell natural healing methods. That's a tough sale to make. Most medical doctors don't believe in them. MDs do two things, primarily write prescriptions and perform surgeries. I'm not putting down the profession. Like I said, sometimes it can make the difference between being alive and dying but I'm personally against putting chemicals into my system and I constantly have to work at that with my medical doctor who would write drugs for just about everything. For example, if you take your 16-year-old child to a dermatologist for acne, they will prescribe antibiotics. And we got a couple of natural healers in the audience. Would you flood your whole body with antibiotics just to kill a couple of pimples on the face? I mean, really, like it's damaging to the liver, the kidneys, the spleen. That's what doctors do in a lot of cases. So they know little or nothing about nutrition, and they don't even think nutrition, or they don't want to even think about it, or alternative therapies. So I'm just trying to show you this is the impossible sale. So if you call up this medical doctor and you say, uh, yes, listen, we uh, provide alternative, and uh, Terry, I'll use you as an example. He has a uh, food allergy test, which finds out what foods you're allergic to that cures 50 different chronic conditions. So anyway, turns out that ADD, headaches, migraine headaches, uh, my daughter had irritable bowel syndrome when we went to the medical doctors and they tested her for everything else and when they can't find anything else to be causing this person, my child, you imagine this, if you love your children, is curled up in a ball in bed all day in pain. You know, and if you're the kind of guy I am, that's not acceptable. And the medical doctor said, it's nothing we can do. It's called irritable bowel syndrome. And what, what is it? Well, we don't really know, but we know when we've exhausted every other possibility, it could be something more serious, then we know it's irritable bowel syndrome. Here, give her these pills, this might help. Made her worse. He has a test that if they can't cure irritable bowel syndrome, the test is free. And she was allergic to six foods, we removed them from her diet, and she is healed. And I told that doctor about that test. Do you think he would now? This is an internist. His specialty is irritable bowel syndrome. And he has still not called you guys, I'm sure. So he calls up, you're a perfect example. He calls him up and he says, yeah, listen, uh, we have some alternative therapies that will uh, help you cure things naturally. Is that a hard sale to make to a medical doctor, Terry? Um, yeah. Impossible. It's, a, it's the impossible sale, okay? So now let me show you how market data changes everything. So first of all, let's talk about getting the appointment. Great marketing data makes getting appointments easier. So this is call one. Hello, doctor. We offer some alternative and natural methods. You know, I'm not interested. That's the doctor. That's his reaction. Call two, and I'll just ad lib here. Yeah, hi, doctor. Um, this is just showing you market data. Doctor, um, we're a company that helps doctors make more money from all their current patients that they're currently serving. 
and uh, we found that you doctors are having some serious problems right now. Would you say that your practice is better than ever or you have more problems than ever? Oh yeah, I have more problems than ever. And one of the things we do is we help you heal your patients better, and I wouldn't even tell them by natural therapies because you're not going to get that appointment. And we've done a little study and we found out that there's five dangerous trends facing medical doctors today. And what I'd like to do is come by and show you what some of those are. I'm going to be in your area anyway. I'm not going to give you the whole spiel here. But what's, what I'm trying to show you is that it's easier to sell education than it is to sell products or services. It's way easier. And there's a lot of clients in the room who now do that. But all they do is sell education. The one I told you about yesterday that got nine, uh, six out of nine appointments, they used to call and say, hi, we sell services to manufacturers. Can we come and talk to you about it? Well, if you didn't think you were interested, they got turned down nine out of ten times. Now they call and say, yeah, we've done a little study here, and we found out that manufacturers are facing five dangerous trends today. And some of these trends, as a matter of fact, Mr. Manufacturer, they can put you right out of business. So uh, what we're doing is a community service to manufacturers since we've been in this business for a while is we're going to offer a free education, I'm going to be in your area, and blah, 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 and boom, get an appointment. Uh, we got a couple dentists in here. You call up a corporation and say, hi, I want to come talk to you about, you know, your dental plan. That's a hard appointment to get. You call up and say, listen, we put on a free educational program on how um, having good dental hygiene can increase and e extend the life of your, your life, actually. Was it six to ten years? Did you know that, by the way? Good dental hygiene increases your lifespan by six to ten years. Hard to believe, but true. Uh, and anyway, so uh, as you know, Mr. Corporation, when you're trying to um, reduce your medical costs, you know, the first point of contact with all nutrition that goes into the body is through the mouth. And what people don't realize is that it can have a profound impact on your health. So we're putting on free. So anytime you offer educational experience, it's a lot easier to sell than trying to sell your products or services. It still has to be sold. Don't get me wrong. It's easier to sell. Okay, and I'm going to drive this home really well. Okay. Now you're in front of the doctor. So I'm with this doctor. Remember the last caption I showed you? He said, not interested. Okay, now let's see if we can turn him to being interested. Doctor, let me ask you a question. In 1992, the average doctor had about 1,000 patients that they handled. How many do you handle now? Oh, God, I got twice that. I handled 2,400 patients. And so you just say that your patient load is just about doubled in the last 10 years, right? Yeah, as a matter of fact, it has. And uh, over that period of time that your patient load has doubled, have your administrative costs gone down or up? Oh, they've gone up. Yes, as a matter of fact, doctor, let me show you. 38% up, as a matter of fact, in the last 10 years. How about your malpractice insurance? Is that going up or down? Oh, that's definitely going up. How about paperwork in order to get the money that you get from the insurance companies? Is that going up or down? Oh, that's going up. And what about your income, doc? How's that going over the past uh, 10 years? Is that going up or down? So you see, I'm ha the guy is riveted now. He's like, I want to. I'm listening. That, that, that's the big difference. Okay, uh, has that stayed the same or risen? Well, the doctor actually, we can show you statistically, it hasn't gone up at all, has it, Terry? It's like 10 years. It's, it's the same. So you're working twice as hard, making the same money. Actually, you're not making the same money because all of your expenses have gone up. You're working twice as hard. You're making less money than you did 10 years ago. We have a quote in his course story. It says something like. I'd be better off flicking bur flipping burgers at Burger King. It's literally a quote from a medical doctor for how hard it is to make a living today. Now he's ready to listen to anything I want to say. He's listening. Still hard. You know, see him? He's listening. Then I say, um, I say, okay, doctor, well, let me just ask you, you know, what do you think of, where do you get all your money? Well, I get it from insurance companies. How do you like that process? Well, I don't like it very much. Well, if we could, would you be interested in building a cash practice? Well, how would I do that? Well, let me show you an area that people are paying a lot of money for. You know, how do you feel about healing people? Is that important to you, doctor? That's called an integrity-based question, which I'm going to, you know, we've got a speaker that's talking about that. It's getting what's important to them, because if you get what's important to them, it's way easier to sell them than what's important to you. So, doctor, would you call yourself a healer? Is that, you know, is that one of the, yeah, that's why you got into medicine, yeah. So healing people is important, right? And whatever method that might be available to heal people would be something of interest to you as long as it works, right? Well, yeah, of course. Well, let me just show you, doctor. As a matter of fact, in 1992, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, we're talking about people spent about $46 billion on natural remedies and natural ways of healing. Why? Because they don't like putting drugs and chemicals in their system. And today, you know what that figures up to? Click, 
Next slide. It's now $460 billion. And do you know how much of that is paid by the insurance companies? Not one dime. So that's all market data. I haven't even talked about what I'm going to try and sell yet, have I? But I have him completely interested, and I led him through a logical progression of information. So let me just say that to you. You know, there's market data that is way more motivational to your client than product data. You understand what I'm saying? So no matter what business you're in, if we take the toy store over here, his strategic position, he sells educational toys and interactive toys. That, as well as novelty stuff, fun, really quirky kind of stuff. Okay. So, here, I think I actually spell it out. Be strategic. Our educational, more interactive toys. I'd want to be an expert on why that's necessary in the society. I bet there are great studies about how television impacts children, about how, how much they watch. Here's a stat. Since 1960, violence on TV has increased 14,000%. Increased Do you know how that's impacted our children? Violence among children since 1960 has increased 11,000%. Not quite a direct par a parallel there, but it just shows you. So no matter what area you're in, you're going to find your buyers could be way more interested and motivated by product information or by what's going on in their <coughs> industry today than by what it is that you sell. And then if you do it right, you have a righteous setup for what it is you sell. Am I getting through? Yes. You want every prospect to think of having your product as a lot more important. So don't go through that document yet. I'll walk you right through it. Did they just hand that out? The one that says how to build a core story. Yes. Now, let me just talk about that concept for a second. I call this the core story because what is the core of what you would say to anyone anytime you would get in front of them? So, there's what market data would make having your product more important. With the shoe company, it was showing women that the more shoes you own, the wealthier you are. It was actually appealing to the ego, ego side of women. Now, so mostly it's hard to appeal to a man's ego with the shoes. You know, but even then they would show the average man has seven shoes, and I'm telling you, it worked really well to get a woman in the store. They'd show that shoe shoeaholic thing. The husband would be going, "Well, how many pairs do you have, honey?" And she goes, "Well, I only have 30." And he goes, well, "I mean, we, they literally had husbands saying, well, 'Why don't you buy six and catch up to the women in your age?'" They had by income exactly how many shoes you should have. It was phenomenal. Okay, so now that's mundane. That is mundane. So you, if you have a complicated situation, what is it that you can show me that's going to make what you sell a lot more important? Dr. Nickel, I'll do some of your thing. So let's just say Dr. Nickel has organ products that are organ, organs, heart, liver, liver, kidney, spleen. He stood up here and said, I've got the greatest organ products in the world, and they're heart, ki kidney, liver, and spleen, and you should have these today. And you kind of go, well, I don't really get that. And even if you could talk about how great they were in the snap, but let me just tell you something. You want, here, let me give you some scary data that is highly motivational. In 1929, the average male had 100 million sperm count per milliliter. Do you know what that is today? 100 million today, 5 million. It literally has fallen off by 95%. Some people say that we are in, in danger of becoming extinct. The av and I'm not kidding. This is actual. We've dropped 95% of our fertility in the last 70 years. And now, you know, 5 million still sounds like a lot because it only takes one sperm to get a woman pregnant. But when it used to be 100 million, it can be kind of scary. And the incidence of infertility among women has increased by 265,000% in the last 65 years. Everybody in the room probably knows a couple can't get pregnant. And now they're going for fertility and doing all these other things. And how has that happened? Why is that happening? Well, did you know we introduced 70,000 new chemicals into our environment in the last 70 years? Do you know what percentage of them have been tested for long-term impact? 3%. So 97% haven't been checked for long-term impact. Do you know that in 19, I may be a little off here, 1940, the average serving of spinach had 265 milligrams of iron. Do you know what it has today? Two. This, this is all factual data. So does this mean that you have a problem getting the nutrition that you need today? And by the way, you want to hear a really fascinating study? When they took radioactive isotopes and they attached them to organs and they fed them to animals and tracked where that nutrition went, when you eat kidney, it goes mostly to your kidneys. When you eat liver, it goes mostly to your livers. 
it's really uh, amazing. So I'm just showing you, and I, and I could go on here, and he could go on way further than me, but by the time this guy gets done with you, showing you all the data about the serious health problems that we have in this country, and then what some of the solutions are as he creates, now the big thing really in his product is the enzymes. Because the first point of contact to the body is the digestive enzymes, and then the next is the metabolic enzymes, and that's what supports all your organs. So this guy could go on and on and on with this stuff. Obviously, I learned a lot about it. I feel like that guy on Cheers with full of all the useless information. It's a little known fact that its sperm count has gone down 95% since. Anyway, so what is it that you could say to me that suddenly makes what you sell a lot more important? Market data is a powerful motivator. Now I will talk about what we did strategically with Paul. The gold service, did you know, so what he used to do is people would call up and say, yeah, I'd like to get my rugs clean. Okay, ma'am, how big is the rug? And they would start going over price. And really, I mean, you know, in a lot of the yellow page ads, they would say, you know, two rooms clean for $18.95. Well, realistically, it's more like $118 per room. So he couldn't really compete with that on price. And, you know, they were losing business left and right because of that. And so what we did is we'd get the average person on the phone and we'd say, well, ma'am, I think you're asking me the wrong question when you ask me how much it is to clean your carpet. The question you need to ask me is, am I qualified? Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, the environmental is all fact, by the way. It's the market data. Let me show you how powerful it is. The uh, Environmental Protection Agency has actually studied the impact of carpeting in your home. In fact, they found that when they removed carpet from government buildings, people got sick like 40% more often than when they had it in there. And you know why they removed it? Because when they looked at the uh, stuff that was in the carpeting, they went, ugh, you know, germs, bacteria. And the average living room is 5 million dust mites and their feces and the bacteria that feeds on it. And so the Environmental Protection Agency has studied that stuff, and they found that basically your rug is like a, a health filter. It captures all the dirt, dust, and pollen. But you know what? About every six months, that becomes saturated. And when it becomes saturated, it's time to get that stuff out of your carpet because now it gets into your environment and you will be sick a lot more often. That's all factual information. I'm not making up any of it. In fact, his people can get your carpets 1,500% cleaner than you can, even if you vacuum it every day. Again, not our opinion, right? Environmental Protection Agency. So now you get on the phone with one of his guys, and then you get on the phone with somebody else, and they're going, eh, it's uh, $18 to clean the room, ma'am, you know, pfft, you know. It just, oh, and then the other thing we do, and this is preempting, it's we teach about the bait and switch. Say, you know, let, let me just tell you, ma'am. Oh, so let's go back to the gold service just for a second. So with that little 90-second education, that's how they got four out of ten of every one of their call-ins to come and sign up for the gold service now, which has made his business way more predictable than it ever was before. And in fact, the first, we used to call it the gold member service. And then when Austin Powers came out with that movie, Gold Member, <laughs> we just cut the member out of there and called it Gold Service. But anyway, now they just like literally, you call in and they go, yeah, can I have your Gold Service number? You know? And, oh, you don't have the Gold Service? And their guys go right into pitching it and they get four out of ten people to sign up just with that little 90-second education that I just put you through. So again, that's market data and it positions you dramatically. It makes what you sell a lot more important. What will heighten the interest? You know, how do you heighten the interest of what it is that you're selling? Can you motivate your buyers to purchase more? What can you do to make them want to buy it more? So with his 90-second education, he gets 4 out of 10 people to sign up for 6-month cleanings. Well, that's a big difference in his business. How can you preempt or disempower the competition at every turn? So that's a strategic objective. We found out what our competitors were saying, then we told our clients what to expect. It totally took the wind out of their sales, a perfect example. Loyalty, brand loyalty, is that something that you want to do? Well, the Gold Service is a brand loyalty program that specifically achieves that. And what are you going to do at the tactical level to implement? As discussed in the session on training, there's six steps to implement. Before we go there, though, let's go back to the stadium and look at some more objectives. Do you want to be, you should write these down. These need to be your strategic objectives. Do you want to be most respected? Do you want to be most popular? If that's a strategic objective, that means you need to throw the best parties. If you want to be most sought out for information, by the way, number one best strategic position you can have, most sought out for information. In every single job I've ever had with every single client I've ever worked with, I try to make them the best source of information available or most educational. 
We had a uh, magazine and all of our competitors had trade shows and we put out the annual trade show calendar. It was one page. It had the whole, you know, January, February, March and showed where every trade show was in the industry. And every single media planner in the marketplace or every single person when they were planning their annual strategies needed that trade show calendar. And our competitors were laughing at us because we were giving away a trade show calendar that promoted all their trade shows. <laughs> they're, they're, they're promoting our trade show and they're a competitor. Well, every person who needed to do a media plan called us to get that trade show calendar. So we had first dibs at them because we were most educational most sought out for information. New people come into the industry and they go, hey, have you seen those guys that work for Chet? Man, they've got a ton of stuff. Yeah, they'll teach you this, they'll teach you that, they'll teach you how to advertise more effectively. So, you know, it's a great strategic position for anybody. Building client loyalty. If that is a strategic objective, what do you have in place to actually help you do that? Okay, Paul's a great example. Generating referrals. If that's a strategic objective, how many systems or procedures do you have? We asked how many people had that. I think one person or two people in the room had that in place. Those are tactics, by the way. We're going to get deep on those tactics. These are the foundational uh, preemptive positioning. Is bonding with clients a strategic objective? Because if it is and you haven't drilled down on what you're supposed to do in order to make that happen, guess what? It's not happening on purpose and it's not happening enough. People do things successfully, but not systematically, and the difference in that is huge. And I stole that one from Scott Hallman, who will be talking about that in great detail. So here's five workshop items, all very powerful. Take five minutes and create the three to five reasons why a client should buy from your company over your competitors. What would preempt competitors? Gold service, bait and switch, scare tactics. Can you scare them away from the com competition? What little extras will you do to create client loyalty, to build positive word of mouth. In some cases, the company needs a strategic position. In other cases, the product or service. What could you do that would make you most sought out for information? This is a great hook for driving leads and creating loyalty. Okay, let's look at this core story document here for a second. This whole front part is like, you know, page one, or it says page six because this goes in order in your book. But you don't have to read all this. It's just basically giving you lots of examples and ideas, and it's giving education. Go to page eight. It says research. And then here, see size of market. Annual billings for the entire industry. For example, if you're real estate, you want to know how many houses are sold each year because one of the things for your stadium or for an individual meeting with a buyer is to be able to come right out of the box with really impressive information. So if I work with any one of you, I guarantee you we, that's the first thing we do. Let's go look at your marketplace because those are where you find the wows and you look at things over 10 years or 20 years. The, the, today if I tell you the average male has 5 million sperm count, it doesn't mean anything. When I tell you it used to be 100 million, it means something. So what can you look at over time that suddenly gives you what I call the wows? What will make people say, wow, I didn't know that? Those are, uh, so industry, you want to find out how many brokers, blah, blah, blah. Major trends, most trade journals will have an annual industry wrap-up. They'll give you the trends for you. It's really fascinating stuff. So then it says, but for right now, list some area you would like to have researched. Some areas that would help you achieve all those strategic objectives that I gave you. So that's page 9. Page 10, score, uh, store, uh, core story elements. Name at least five pain points that would motivate your buyers to become more interested in your products or services. And again, you don't have to read that up. What measurable data, bottom of the page, what measurable data, facts, comparisons, illustrations, construction, performance levels, and buying criteria do you want or need to know and include and where would you put it? Page 11, it says, name at least five pain points that would really motivate your buyers to buy faster. So some is buy more, some is buy faster. And I'm telling you, this stuff is so powerful. Now, there's a lot of people in the room already either have this data or have had some research done or already barreling in this direction. How many? Okay, it's like half the room. Okay, so there's a lot of people really understand this. 
And then it says, bottom, say, describe, define, name the problem, challenge, question, or issue for which your company product or service is the only viable solution. Explain why. It says, name at least five pain points that would motivate your buyers to buy more. So we have buy faster, we have buy more often, we have buy more. Okay. What we're going to do is I'm going to give you some chance to work on this a little later tonight, actually, because just to keep us on schedule here. So let me finish this up. Features tell, benefits sell. Largest landscape company. Is that a feature or benefit? That's a feature. Smartest manufacturing rep firm. There's no benefit yet, yet right? Most stylish architectural design firm. No benefit. A plaque company that gives you, I'll skip that one here. Landscape company that helps you cut costs while getting superior landscaping. Okay. A manufacturer of oils and lubricants that helps our clients dominate their local area. Okay. Architectural firm that helps you create business designs that will help you stand out in the crowd and attract more clients. In the old days, Madison Avenue used to call it a unique selling proposition or a USP. That's an internal focus based upon your greatest strength. Okay? Now, much more powerful, what's your ultimate strategic position based upon market trends or market data? That's an external focus, and it makes a huge difference. So what market information? Now, let me just tell you something. What market factors support your ultimate strategic position? Motivation comes from two factors, problems and solutions. Which one do you think is more motivational? Okay, this room is Chet trained because every other room I've ever asked that they always say solutions. But real motivation comes from problems. If you really want to motivate people, and I've already made that point, I put that doctor in so much pain, he was ready to buy and I hadn't even described any products or services yet. Okay? So understand that part of your research is to find the pain. And again, there's a group here that does this. They do it for all my clients. If they do it for you, you won't have to explain any of this to them. They'll teach you, they'll teach you it. Another company that wanted to try and sell to advertising agencies their graphic services, and they did big billboards and things like this. So we put together a killer orientation that talked about the five most dangerous trends facing advertising agencies. Well, it's pretty hard to turn down that appointment. You know, we'll come and teach you the five most dangerous trends facing advertising agencies today and how you can avoid these trends. It's a very, very hard thing to miss. Employee benefits client, they would call up and say, you know, there's five dangerous trends. Notice how there's a theme here, guys, or a pattern. Is there a pattern coming to your mind? You could literally write your stadium speech. It would be called the five most dangerous trends facing some. Because if I walk out here and you guys are my stadium, and I walk out and say, you know, look, I'm here to talk about the five most dangerous trends facing you guys here today. And if those trends are real and they're scary, I have you riveted to the page. So for manufacturers, for I don't care what it is you sell, the legal services, what are the biggest problems facing these, uh, these production companies today? That's way more motivational. Okay, so two scenarios, one with research, one without. A client that's just creating a program that he thinks is franchisable. And so, you know, you can show that business failure rate in this country is like 80% within one year and then 92% within five years or something like that. Do so you know what the failure rate of franchises is? It's like 8%. 92% of franchises are successful. And again, I'm not exactly on the data here. But if you're trying to sell something that's a franchise, the market data is going to be way more powerful than you saying, here's my franchise, isn't it great? Understand, guys? Okay, so some of the stuff's being used in many different industries, as he pointed out. Primezyme, Dr. Nickel already talked about that. His stuff is unbelievable. I'm on it right now. So here is a serious problem where strategy made all the difference. But client, they are a safety distributor. You know what a distributor does? They buy from other people and they distribute to customers. So that means that, so that you, if you buy, this is safety, safety uh, provider. So if you want to buy hard hats, you don't want to go to the hard hat company, the safety glove company, the safety goggle company, the safety um, you know, uh, first aid kit company. Those are a lot of separate phone calls. So what happens is there's distributors that just carry all that stuff for you, and they have it all in one location. You make one phone call, you can buy all your safety equipment for one. Well, 
these guys, <clears throat> so what had happened is about eight years ago, and they were a really successful company doing fine. They were one of the four largest uh, distributors in the country, and they were doing great. And then the crunch hit in manufacturing in this country is going down. Lots of people are going to uh, other uh, countries to do some of their manufacturing. And the safety equipment started dropping, and the manufacturers, in a panic mode, approached some of the industrial supply companies, the guys that sell the mops and the brooms and the toilet paper, and they said, you know, look, you know, you guys are selling to these industri industrial companies anyway. Why don't you add safety equipment? Well, they, they did. They thought, and since it's not our main area, we don't have to make, you know, primo margin on it. The safety client of mine was making, like, 40 and 50% margins. We'll sell it for 20 you know, 20% margins. Well, it just like this guy went down, you know, like dropping $5 million a year every year, closing plants, putting people out of jobs, laying people off. The whole entire distributor market was in that same kind of trouble. So they come to me and they want my help and I'm like, you know, wow, that's, that's a challenge, man. I don't know how we're going to do this one. And <clears throat> the motivation at companies was to go out and find cheaper stuff. So even at the uh, purchasing level is saying, look, find ways to reduce costs in our safety products. Find ways to reduce costs, period. And I know another fellow who sells to uh, Ford, and he's highly dependent upon them. He fells, sells to all the big manufacturers. They said to him, we're just, uh, we're, you have to reduce your prices by 3% across the border. You can't sell to us. I mean, so what's he going to do? <laughs> Give up Ford and General Motors and Honda? No way. He dropped his prices. So anyway, these guys had a serious problem, and I get in there, and I start interviewing people, and I, and I, I mean, I can't find anything. I don't know how I'm going to help this guy. His margins have to be two times higher than anyone else. Actually, he's working on a 22% margin now, and it's still not cheap enough. And, and it's really hard, and I'm interviewing, I'm interviewing, I get about eight people into the company, and I'm talking to one of the guys down in the bowels of the organization. He's from the South, and I say, tell me a situation where you're able to turn... A happy is one of my interview questions, where you're able to turn an unhappy client into a happy one. Hmm. Okay, I had one the other day where a client uh, calls up and they were complaining because the safety gloves that we sold them were falling apart and guys were getting their hands burned. And he called them and said, what kind of cheap crap gloves are you selling us here? My guys are getting their hands burned. They're getting hand injuries because these gloves are no good. So I go to the records and I find out we ain't sold them gloves in three months. Well, what happened? Well, the purchasing manager, in order to save money, was buying cheaper gloves from somewhere else. And it hit me. When you're buying safety equipment, should your main criteria be price or should it be safety? Why didn't they think of that? So from that place, now from that strategic position, remember how strategy changes everything, now we suddenly were in a much better position, faulty gloves, super strategy, teach the market a safer way to buy. Does that make sense? But you call up the purchasing manager and you say, you know, listen, um, I sell, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we know more about safety than anybody. We'll never sell you bad gloves, this and that. It's not that motivational. So what we ended up doing was put together. The super strategy was teach the market a safer way. Sub-strategy, free education provided access to the top decision makers. So now we call up the uh, chief financial officer because that's the one telling the purchasing manager, reduce the price, reduce the price, reduce the price. And we say to that chief financial officer, listen, you know, we've got this orientation we put together, and it's the five most dangerous trends facing all manufacturers today. And, you know, and they say, well, what do you do? Well, we sell safety equipment. You know, oh, well, I don't have anything to do with safety. See our safety director, see our purchasing manager, all these people who cannot affect price. We we'll say, well, let me ask you a question, uh, sir. Does your uh, uh, safety director deal with litigation? No, no, he doesn't deal with litigation. Does he have anything to do with uh, employee benefits? No. Uh, what about uh, workers' compensation, insurance issues, and things of that? Because, by the way, do all those things go up if you have an un unsafe environment? You're darn straight they do. So, again, market data provided superior access. For the first time in five years, this guy's sales went up. <laughs> he is extremely grateful and changed the world. I'm just trying to show you guys, you know, I don't care what your problem is or what you're dealing with. If you think more you will find strategies that can overcome your problems and change everything. And what will happen is the more you get into the market data aspect of it, and understand great marketers know that market data is way more motivational than product data, it really will change everything. Uh, I'm going to skip this one because it's complicated. Here's one that's not as complicated, but it's a great example. This is the Journal of Accountancy. 
is competing with the AICPA, so that's the, forget what it's called, the American something. Anyway, they have 340,000 circulation. My client had 46,000 circulation. So they're competing against a competitor that's 10 times bigger than them. And they were like the fourth or fifth buy in the market. They could not get the business. And you would think they'd have done some research, right? <laughs> I did, we had uh, some research done. Uh, and we found out that there were about 46,000 top decision makers in the firms that control 340,000 accountants. And guess who's reading their magazine, mostly. So, I mean, I'm just showing you in two seconds here this one little strategy of showing just by doing some studies on the industry. In other words, if you want to sell something to a Deloitte Touche, you know, do you want to be reaching the managing partner and the top executives there, or do you want to be reaching the rank and file executives down in the bottom uh, of the accounting chain? They don't have any influence on anything, not a phone, not a paperclip, nothing. So by just showing, again, strategy, by just showing that the smaller part of the market controls the entire part of the market, they went from being a secondary buy to being a main buy. This is the last most important concept I want to go It's called setting the buying criteria or shifting it. If you study the best salespeople, they do things really well before they even attempt to sell. They find out your current buying criteria. It's a great question. You ever ask somebody before you try to sell them, you know, what's your buying criteria? What's the decision-making criteria you would have? It's pretty hard if I give you that decision criteria and then I come back at you and sell within that criteria that, to have you not buy. But then the other thing is they set up an even better buying criteria. Paul's guys change the buying criteria. That person calls up, their buying criteria is price. By the time he gets done, he shifts it off of price to health, to uh, quality, to the knowledge, to certification. He shifted the buying criteria. So that's what I'm trying to show you. You can shift the buying criteria. And here's some consumer examples. Pizza delivered in 30 minutes or you pay less. That shifted the buying criteria off of pizza, didn't it? What became the new buying criteria? Speed of delivery. It changed everything. How about when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight? Who can remember when it never had to be there overnight? Right? I mean, you know, in the, in the early 80s, it never had to be there overnight. By the mid-80s, it absolutely positively had to be there overnight. They changed our buying criteria. So great exercise for you. What's the current criteria and what should it be? So let me ask you this question. Could most of you teach your clients a much smarter way to buy your products or services? Could you? In other words, could you take my, if I'm a potential buyer for you, could you take my buying criteria and totally shift it? Okay? So that's the point. It's like whatever it is that you sell or market, if you are an expert in a way that helps your client succeed, and I don't care what it is, we use Bob in the back of the room, he does video, so what he wants to do is do video education. Well, if he can show me that visual education has three times more impact than audio education, it's already motivating me more toward video education. Does that make sense? Okay. Developing a slogan, here's the rules. It should, con it should describe the product or service unless the name so pizza delivered in 30 minutes or less. But if you call Domino's Pizza, you wouldn't need to say pizza in there. Uh, slogan should contain a benefit. We already talked about the difference between features and benefits. These are the four rules, guys. A slogan positions your company above the competition. And ideally, a slogan sets up a buying criteria in which your product or service is the most logical choice. And you are the market educator. It creates an automatic superior access vehicle. Everybody get this? Okay. So this is what I call superior access vehicle, an approach that gives you superior access. Since we know it's harder to get in the door than ever before, what can you create that would make people want you to come in the door faster and easier? Well, I think I've already answered that. Education. What's easier to sell than what you sell now but would lead to making a bigger sale? When I sell my personal services, I will do a free orientation for anybody, and then and that's what I used to do. When I, how, that's how I got all my Fortune 500 clients. Call up and make some outstanding promise to teach them something, whether they ever bought from me or not. Then we get in there and totally shift their buying criteria, and if they agreed with the criteria that I laid out for them, who else are you going to buy it from? 
So what's free and easier to sell? That's a better question. What is free that you could offer? You still have to sell anything it is, but what's free that would make your buyers go, hmm, now that sounds kind of interesting. And I'll just tell you right now, for me, it's always a free education of some kind. But it has to be interesting to them. And if it involves the words dangerous trends, you're already ahead of your competitors. Free education. <clears throat> so, Tara, we offered to do free orientations for the entire staff of ad agencies. And in there, they disempowered every form of media and showed why outdoor signage was the most important thing you could buy today. Very powerful. So, what would make your prospect want to come right to the phone? That's what this is, a superior access vehicle. Create vehicles that provide superior access. Since getting in the door is the hardest thing we have to do today, what can you do that will generate more interest than ever before? A free audio tape that teaches you how to succeed. <laughs> One of the best vehicles, I don't know if you're still using it because it's like three years ago, but Terry had this thing we did where we got some like 200 doctors on the telephone. We did an educational program that's similar. Like I said, it laid out all the problems and everything. And then at the end, they had five or six of their doctors come on the phone and talk about how they now offer this food allergy testing and how that's... You still use that? Yeah. That's a powerful vehicle, isn't it? Powerful tool. But it uses all the market data. I have another client that had to get furniture stores to sign up for their website. So we did an educational program for them tapes, free conferences, transcripts, reports. Well, how about you guys to get you here? Did you see, go to any free conferences or attend any free events or, you know, practice what I preach, right? What could you sell that would be a lot easier? So it's pretty hard to sell you into a $3,000 event, but in fact, it was easier to sell you into a free, we charged for a couple of them, like $10, because it weeded out the, the riffraff. But no, I mean, just people, you know, we could 3,000 people on the phone, and when you, you know, unless you have her teleconference services, you have to pay for that. Workshop, two minutes on an easier sale, and again, I've got that in that worksheet, so let me summarize. Look at the current buying criteria and see if you can shift the buying criteria. What market factors will make your product seem more important? Can you deliver your story in some educational format because it makes it easier to get in? And I don't care what industry or business you're in, I'm going to drive this home to you. And again, even in retail, I'll just use the, the, the toy store because I did this on his 5-in-1 call, if you had some data about what's going on with kids today and what their problems are and what influences are going on in society, you can get people to come, and any parent, to be interested in that. And then if you can show how having interactive toys or educational toys you know, can increase and improve, and there's studies on all that stuff. Absolutely. And then you become the educational force, and today with the Internet being what it is, that's the next model for you, I would think. If you have unusual toys, you know, how many parents here, you know, around Christmas time are looking for something educational that would be fun for your kids? It's very tough. Can you crystallize your new buying criteria into a slogan? Okay, we already talked about that. What philosophies do you have about your business? Write a mission statement that focuses on growing your business by serving your client. Or a better one would be write one that shows on how to grow your clients. <laughs> Just